Well, we're going to continue our series on holiness this morning. We've been talking the last few weeks about the holiness of God, but today we're going to turn our attention to our holiness and what does it look like to respond to the holiness of God. Now, when we think about it, we often have a positive view of God's holiness. When I talk about it and preach on it and say God is holy, everybody's like, yes, thanks for the reminder, he is holy, like I need to be focused on that. We're thankful that he's perfect, right? We're thankful that he's good. We're thankful that he is holy in all of his attributes. He's worthy of our worship. And as we said last week, it's helpful to remember he's the standard, right? Other people are not the standard. (laughs) God is the standard. And all of that helps us to be humbled. It helps us to worship him. It draws us to the cross as the means by which we are saved. And so all of that is very positive. And most people even if it's a little bit nerve-wracking to see God as holy, we have a positive view of God's holiness. Now, when we shift to people, we tend to shift in a negative direction. Usually when we use the word holy to talk about someone, it's not positive. So we'll say like, man, they have such a holier-than-thou attitude. Okay, what are we getting at? Well, they think they're better than everybody else. They think they're righteous and nobody else, right? That's kind of what we mean. Sometimes we'll talk about somebody who's too expressive in worship and they're, they're, they're too demonstrative, drawing attention to themselves, saying, man, that's a holy roller. You ever heard that phrase? You know, they're a holy roller. Sometimes people will, will say, oh, they're coming from the holy tra- holiness tradition. Might see a woman in a long dress or a dude with a long beard. We talk about these things as though they're very strange. So while we associate holiness with God as a positive attribute, we often associate holiness with people as a negative attribute, something different, off-putting, and odd. Are you tracking with me? Now, why is this? Let me give you several reasons. First, because I think we've been disappointed by spiritual leaders, all of us, myself included, we've all been disappointed by spiritual leaders who claim holiness publicly but don't live out holiness in private. And this is not unique to any church, you know, one church or theological stream or group. Uh, We are all confronted by what feels like a never-ending stream of high-profile, well-known spiritual leaders that teach us how to be holy but then do unholy things. And that's hard to process, right? If holiness is impossible for our spiritual heroes what hope do we have, (laughs) right? And so we don't wanna be self-righteous, so I think a lot of us just figure it's just better to not try at all. We'll just give in to our unrighteousness. I think the second reason we think about holiness kind of negatively around people is because we all of us, if we're honest, we all struggle with holiness ourselves. It's, It's not just we're disappointed with spiritual leaders, but we struggle with making commitments to God we don't keep. Church, are, we, are we awake this morning in church? Does anybody else have this problem? This is just me. Okay. We sin against the Lord. We sin against each other. And we are disappointed with ourselves, with our own depravity. And sometimes, if we're honest, we don't even want to be holy. Sometimes we wake up in the morning and like, do I even want to be holy? Like, you know, those mornings you get up, like, I don't want to open my Bible because I know it's going to tell me something I don't want to hear. It's like, I'm just not going to open it this morning because I, I don't want to be confronted with my sin. <laughs> I just want to go, you know, pleasure-seeking. I want to be selfish today because holiness feels, here's the word, unnatural to us. It feels unnatural. But I think third reason we kind of use the word negatively talk about people is because we're not convinced. I would, I would submit to you, I don't think we're convinced of the benefits of holiness in our daily life. I mean, I I think we look around and we see evil, selfish people like getting ahead and we're like, if I go the direction of holiness, like, does that help anything? Like, does that, are there practical benefits from pursuing a life of holiness? And, you know, we, we wanna honor God, I think, at a deep, down level, but we also wanna be popular with our friends and fit in and, you know, we don't wanna be the weird one. Come on, church. Like, you all say this to your teenagers, like, don't give in to peer pressure, you know, it's really bad. But then we all give in to it. Here's the truth. Holiness is the calling of every Christian. 
Okay, write that down. Holiness is the calling of every Christian. God calls his children to be holy as he is holy. Will we fall short? Of course. This is the reason we worship Jesus, our Savior, who came and gave his life for us and deposited the Holy Spirit within us because we know we can't achieve holiness on our own. This is our confession as Christians. We can't do this on our own. But we also know that holiness should be the desire of everyone who's born again. Holiness should be the desire, I'm not saying it always is, but it should be, the desire of each person who is born again. Because of this, we need a positive outlook on holiness as Christians. Not moral superiority, not self-righteousness, but Christ-like holiness. That phrase is very important to me, Christ-like holiness. So far in this series, we've traced the doctrine, the teaching of the holiness of God, which is paramount. And I've said to you over and over again, everything in the Christian faith flows out of our understanding of God's holiness. But today, we want to look at our journey toward that holiness. Here's who God is. We should desire that. We struggle to desire it. How can we move toward holiness? holiness. Before we read the text, I just want to say this to you as you listen to the message today. Before you check out, the devil wants you to believe that you can't ever be holy. The devil wants to convince you that this sermon's not for you, that holiness is impossible, that this whole message is a waste of time. The devil is a liar. He is a liar. Do not believe that lie. God calls every Christian to holiness. Remember what we said last week. Other people are not the standard. God is the standard. And that helps us to be aware of how much we need Jesus, but also gets our eyes off each other and gets our eyes on him. He's the one we're going after. I pray that the message today will stir your heart that you would want to be holy as God is holy. All right, let's stand together and read 1 Peter 1. Starting in verse 13 down to verse 21. Such a great passage. Just listen, pay attention to these words, very important. This is God's word to us today. Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance, but as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed from your empty way of life, inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Holy Spirit, thank you for these words. Please help us to understand and apply them. In Christ's name we pray, amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much. We got a lot of ground to cover. I'm going to haul tail through this sermon, so try to stay with me. 
Take lots of notes, okay? What are we talking about? We're going to talk about the command in this passage to be holy. I want you to understand what we're commanded to do, why we should pursue it, why we struggle to pursue it. I want to talk about the Christian journey to holiness, so you understand what the Christian faith talks about the journey. And then I want to give you a holistic picture of holiness. It's very, very important. You understand a holistic picture. And at the end, a couple of commitments I want to ask you to make as we move toward holiness. Like I said, we got a lot of ground to cover. What's the command in verse 15 of this passage? The command is be holy in all your conduct. Look at the language of verse 15 very carefully. As the one who called you is holy. What's the standard? Who's he pointing to? He's pointing to God. God's holiness is the true north, the perfect standard. I say that to remind you again and again and again until I'm a broken record. Our culture does not define holiness. The church does not define holiness. God defines holiness. He says, be holy as I am holy. He's the standard. We're going after him. He says, be holy in all your conduct. Notice the scope. Not part of your life. Not Sundays and Wednesdays. All of your life. All of your conduct, you are to be holy. Now, why does he say all? Because he knows we are tempted to compartmentalize our holiness. To pursue holiness at church, in small group, in Bible study, but then to, listen, pursue the world at work, at home, and on our phone. God commands us, be holy in all your conduct, all places, at all times, in all ways. I want you to get this deep into your soul this morning. The final destination of the Christian life is holiness. The final destination, what are we moving toward? What is the end of this journey? It is holiness, specifically Christ-likeness. God is moving us, me and you, toward holiness. He is shaping you to be more and more like Jesus. You see, God knows that sin destroys lives. Sin destroys you, and sin destroys the people around you. And so God is committed to working out sin out of your life and holiness into your life. The question is whether you're going to collaborate with him and work with him or if God is going to do this with you kicking and screaming. But God is going to do it. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he is moving you toward the destination of holiness in all your conduct. So why should we pursue holiness? First, because Peter says our God is holy and we want to be like him. This is the motivation of worship. Peter gives the first reason in verse 16, for it is written, because it's written, be holy as I'm holy. This is a direct quote from Leviticus eleven forty four, 44, <coughs> which says this, for I am the Lord your God, you, so you must consecrate yourself and be holy because I am holy. This phrase, be holy because I am holy, is repeated five times in the book of Leviticus. Holy, Leviticus is often called the holiness code of the Old Testament. And here's the heart of the book of Leviticus. If you read through the book of Leviticus, you're going to read a lot of law, a lot of restrictions and codes and things they were supposed to do. But here's the heart underneath it. God telling his people, do not live like the nations around you. If you, if you read through Leviticus, you'll see over and over and over again, he keeps saying, don't worship their gods, don't do what they do, don't follow their laws, don't follow their habits. You should be holy as I am holy, not be like the people around you. This is the heart of the book of Leviticus. Why am I sharing that with you? Because it's so important to understand. We read Leviticus and we often throw Leviticus out because we're like, hey, praise God, we're not in the Old Testament times anymore. Jesus fulfilled the dietary laws. Thank God we can eat bacon. Like we're all about that, right? He fulfilled the dietary laws. He fulfilled the sacrificial laws. You didn't know none of y'all brought a lamb with you to church this morning. We're so thankful that he fulfilled that. But listen to me. Just because he fulfilled the specific commands of Leviticus does not mean that the overall command to be holy has changed. 
You see, I think it's a lie of the enemy that tells us, oh, that's Old Testament. We don't have to be holy anymore because we're in the New Testament. No, that's why we're reading 1 Peter 1 today because Peter wants to connect us to the Old Testament and says, yes, while the holiness code of the Old Testament has been fulfilled in Jesus, the holiness command continues. The holiness command continues. Church, listen to me. The holiness command continues. Just because Jesus fulfilled the dietary law and the sacrificial system doesn't mean that we are not to pursue holiness today. Instead, we are to pursue it at an even deeper level. We are not just to be separate from the culture around us and all the external things, but now we're to be separate at a heart level. We're to be set apart because of what we worship and what we love. The command to be holy was in the Old Testament, the command to be holy is in the New Testament because God always wants his children to be holy as he is holy. Tracking with me? Number two, because we were purchased by the blood of Christ. Peter wants to make sure that we understand that we are to pursue holiness because we have been purchased not with money but with the most precious of materials, the blood of the Son of God. God purchased us, redeemed us through the life of his one and only son. And this gratitude and appreciation should move our hearts toward wanting holiness. Let me say it this way. He gave all of his self, all of his life to rescue us. So we commit to give all of our lives to serve him. Number three, because holiness helps our witness. Look at verse 17. Peter says we are to be holy so we can live effectively as, this is the word I want you to see, strangers. You see it in the text? We are to be strangers during our time on earth. This is huge for you to get into your heart to make sure you desire holiness. Peter starts the letter, beginning of chapter one, he calls them exiles, and now he calls them strangers. Saints, this place is not your home. This is not your home. If you are born again, you have been adopted into God's family and now you are living for his eternal kingdom. So stop trying to fit in here. Stop trying to look like the world. As we grow in holiness, we will feel out of step with the world. If you never feel out of step with the world, something is wrong in your Christian life. This is not a bug in the system. This is a feature of the system. This is what Christianity teaches. This is the way the Christian life is designed to work. Our distinctiveness is part of our witness. If we don't look different, then how's anybody supposed to know we worship someone different? We don't fit in. We don't do what the world does. We live for a different kingdom. Fourth, we should desire holiness because holiness is our future. Friends, this is where we're going. Verse 13 says, we look ahead to the future grace to be brought to us in Christ. Why are we looking ahead to a future grace? Because there's a day coming when if you believe in Jesus, you will be resurrected just the way he was. There is a future resurrection promised for the people who believe in Jesus. He was resurrected, given a new body, right? And we, when we are resurrected, when we will be given a new body, holiness is our future. We are moving toward a day when sin will be removed from our lives. We will be given a body that's not broken anymore. We will be given a holy heart, desire, perfect mind, no more sin in us. Holiness is where we're going. So we should practice that holiness today. If all this is true, why then do we struggle so badly with holiness? First, because we have old habits. Amen? We have old habits. We have patterns of living that we have built over years that we have to unlearn. We have to unlearn them. And undoing old habits is harder than you think. We have to identify them and we have to acknowledge them. And then we have to believe that God can actually deliver us from them. And then we have to establish new habits to replace the old habits. This is a hard process. This is why we have a whole ministry called Regeneration, to help us in recovery, to help us understand and articulate. This is all the jacked up habits we've built and to tell them to somebody, to identify them, and then to say to somebody, help me learn how to change these and get out of these old habits. But this is very hard to do. So why we struggle. Number one, we have old habits. Number two is because the flesh remains. When we're saved, the power of sin is broken, but the presence of sin is not yet removed. Many Christians misunderstand this and find themselves disillusioned with their battle with sin. 
A lot of Christians say, hey, I got saved. I prayed that prayer. I feel like the Holy Spirit came into my life. Why am I still battling with sin? Because the flesh remains. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you will be fighting sin. Let me say it again. As long as you have breath in your lungs, you will be fighting sin, and you should be fighting sin. I read a quote last night from John Owen. He said, the moment when you stop fighting sin is when you are most in danger. Jesus conquered the flesh, but he did not remove the flesh. He will remove the flesh one day whenever we're resurrected, but until that day, the flesh remains. We have to war with it. Number three, because the devil lies. We struggle with holiness because Satan keeps doing to us what he's done from the very beginning. Satan's strategy is the same from Genesis chapter three all the way to this day. What does Satan do? He makes sin look good and God look bad. That's all Satan does. He lies to us about sin, just like he did with Adam and Eve. Hey, look at this fruit, isn't this amazing? This would be so wonderful, it's so beautiful, you should eat this, even though God told him not to. Satan lies to us about sin. You're gonna feel great if you do this. This will be wonderful. Make your life wonderful if you do this. Look, everybody else is enjoying it. You should enjoy it. He makes sin look good, and then he lies to us about God. Why would God keep that from you? God doesn't really love you. God's not a good God. You can't follow him. His laws aren't good, right? This is what Satan does, and listen to me. He is a liar. He is a father of lies. This is what Jesus says. If you wanna go to war spiritually, you better know your enemy is a liar. You better know that you are being lied to every day by a real spiritual enemy. And this is why we struggle with holiness. It's because we believe the lies of the devil. Finally, because we want to fit in. I don't think we give this dynamic enough credit. As I said earlier, we talk about peer pressure with our teenagers, but we very rarely talk about this with each other, but this is real. We all want to drink at the happy hour after work. I don't want to go to the happy hour and be the one guy there not drinking. Church, come on, somebody's gotta talk to me this morning. Y'all got real quiet now, right? Because now I'm in, your, I'm in your business right now. This is real talk, okay? I don't wanna go to the buffet and not be the one that's not gorging myself. Come on, church. I don't wanna be the one person that doesn't have the latest clothes, the newest car, the nicest house. I want to be loved by everyone. I wanna be in this relationship. I know I shouldn't be in this relationship. I know this person's not a Christian, da, 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 but I wanna be loved by somebody and so I wanna fit in. Listen, here's what is true. We want God and we want every pleasure of the world at the same time, but we cannot be holy and worldly at the same time. You can't. You gotta pick. You wanna be holy, you wanna be worldly. You gotta pick. The battle's real. But thank God, the resources of the Christian faith are robust. Let me explain to you very quickly the Christian journey to holiness. Three steps, ready? Number one, justification. This is when we are declared righteous in Christ. When you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you believe in him as your Lord and Savior, the Bible says you are declared righteous in God's sight through the blood of Christ. This is important for you to understand. Justification happens in a moment, instantaneously. You are declared righteous. It's sometimes called the great exchange. Jesus takes your sin, you take his righteousness. You with me? Okay, in this moment, your past is forgiven. You receive the gift of eternal life. You are adopted into God's family as his son or his daughter. You experience a change positionally. You're reconciled to God. When we talk about getting saved, this is what we're talking about, justification. When you put your faith in Jesus, you believe in him, you pray to receive Christ, all that language is talking about this moment when you're justified in Christ. Listen to Paul discuss justification in Romans 3, to 24. He says this, quote, the righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, since there's no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Listen, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, end quote. The moment we believe in Jesus, we are justified by his grace. That's step one. Step two is sanctification. This is where we are made righteous by Christ. Justification is where I'm declared righteous in Christ, But sanctification is the, listen, important word, process, the process by which I am actually made righteous by Christ. This is where we become increasingly holy over a lifetime of work by the empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. Justification happens in a moment. Sanctification, write this down, happens over a lifetime. Sanctification over a lifetime. We are changed 
by daily interaction with the word of God, the people of God, the spirit of God, we progressively learn to live more and more in line with our identity in Jesus Christ. To put them together, sanctification is learning to live out your justification. Sanctification is learning to live connected more day by day into your new identity as being justified by Christ. The goal of sanctification is that you and I would look more and more like Jesus over time. Now, it's holistic. It's not one part of you. It's not just about escaping hell so you can get to heaven. It's so that all of you can become more like Christ in your character. If justification is about you having a change in position, sanctification is about having a change in character over time. Listen to Paul discuss sanctification in Romans 6, 12 through 14. He says this, Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. But those who are alive from the dead offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law but under grace. Sanctification is a lifelong journey that is only complete at step three, which is glorification. This is when we are resurrected like Christ. Justification, declared righteous in Christ. Sanctification, being made righteous by Christ so that I can be glorified one day, which is when I'm resurrected like Christ. This is when, as I've said before, we are resurrected from the dead and we live, this is the important phrase, without sin, forever with God. Glorification happens in the future. If you are here today and you are a believer in Jesus, justification has happened in your past, sanctification is happening right now, and glorification is coming. This is what we're talking about today. There is a moment coming where not only will you be saved and be made more sanctified in Christ, but there's a day coming when you will be giving a new nature. When Jesus walked out of that tomb, he had a brand new body. And this is what I want you to understand. When you and I are resurrected, body and soul fully renewed in the image of God, this is what's coming. Listen to Paul put all the pieces together in Romans 8, 28 through 30. And listen carefully because Romans 28, we quote all the time and we misquote it because we don't read it in context. Listen to what Paul's talking about. He says this. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. We all know that verse. Listen to what the purpose is in the next verse. For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. Conformed to the image of his son. What is the good thing that God is doing through all the things in your life? He's conforming you to the image of his son. He's making you more like Jesus. He's not getting you a bigger house and a boat. He is making you like Jesus. He is using everything in your life, good, bad, and ugly, to change you so that at the end of the journey, you're resurrected and you look like Jesus. That is the thing he's doing. This is what he says. He says, for those he foreknew, he predestined so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. In verse 30, he pulls it all together. Those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. Predestined, called, justified, conformed, glorification. This is what I'm trying to explain to you guys. Jesus saves us from sin, not just in the sense that he reconciles us to God, so now we're sons and daughters, but he literally is saving us from sin today. He is literally changing us today. And one day, he will fully save us from sin when he removes sin from us completely. So when we say salvation, we mean all of this. Justification, sanctification, glory, faith. This is the full work of the same work of Jesus on the cross. He is doing this thing to change you, to make us more holy. This is why Peter then says, be holy in all of your conduct because all of this is happening. Now, when he says be holy in all of your conduct, we have to have a holistic view of sanctification. Our whole being is being changed. A holistic view of sanctification is so important so that you don't fall into the trap of moralism. That is just looking good on the outside, but your heart is not for God. 
The trap of dualism, which is you are holy in some context and not in other contexts. The trap of legalism, which is you add a bunch of rules to your faith that are not in God's word so that you can force yourself to be holy. Or worldliness, which is just living like the world. What does it mean, practically, to be holy in my whole being, a holistic view of holiness? I'm gonna give you five components. You could probably flesh this out and make it 10, but I just gotta go, I'm, I'm time limited this morning, and so I'm trying to help you understand what does a holy life look like. Number one, your identity. How do I see myself? Peter calls us, in this text, obedient children of God. Is that how you see yourself, Christian? We talk a lot about it, hey, I'm a child of God, I'm a son or daughter of God. He adds an important word to the beginning of that, obedient child. Is that your identity? Is that how you see yourself in relationship with God? Or when somebody says, who are you, is your identity built into your job, your money, your achievement, your family, your looks, your accomplishments? Or is your identity is I am an obedient child of God, that is who I am. You have to be holy in your identity. You have to be holy in how you understand yourself. Do not allow the world to define you. Do not allow the world to tell you this is who you are because you have these desires, or this is who you are because you think these thoughts, or this is who you are because it's the color of your skin. You need to hear God's voice telling you this is who you are, this is your identity. And Peter nails it in this text. He says, as obedient children of God, this is how we live. Do you think of yourself that way? You have to be holy in your identity. Number two, holy in your desires. I'm gonna preach now. Peter says, put away the desires of your former ignorance. We need to be sanctified in our desires. One of the great errors of this generation of Christians is thinking that your desires are your desires and they will never change. Listen to me, church. I talk to too many people who say, well, these are my sinful desires. I'm always gonna have these sinful desires. And so the Christian life is about managing my sinful desires and they're never gonna change. That is not recognizing the power of the blood of Jesus to change us. Listen, you are going to struggle with sinful desires, but don't minimize God. Are you saying God can't change your heart? He can't change your desires? That those things you desire that are sinful, you're gonna struggle with that sinful desire the rest of your life? Who are you saying that to God? Are you saying to God he can't change you? Of course God can change you. This is the whole power of the gospel and the blood of Jesus. And if you have that mindset, you're never gonna repent of the desires in your heart that you should not have. The, Bi the Bible is very clear. Every one of us in this room, we all have sinful desires. We all have things in our hearts that we should not desire. We put things in disorder. We, we make things above God we shouldn't put above God. We have wrong desires there. We should repent of that. We desire unholy things that we want and God says don't desire those things. And so listen, we have to commit our desires to God. God, I wanna be holy in my desires. I'm gonna repent of my desires. Peter's very clear. Do not live according to the desires of your former ignorance. He says that in this text. In other words, there was a time in your life where you didn't care. Ignorance, ignorance means I don't care, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. Whatever I feel like doing, I just go do that. He says that's the way you used to live, but now that Christ is in you, now that the Holy Spirit is in you, now you have the power to not live by the desire of your former ignorance, but actually change your desires to be more like Jesus Christ. And so friends, you need to commit that to God. Is it easy? No, it is hard. Is it a lifelong journey? Yes, but it's possible. It's possible. You should, every year you're walking with Jesus, every year you're growing in sanctification. Listen to me, every decade you're walking closer with God. Your desires should be more for the things of God and less of the world. If you've been walking with Jesus for 30 years and your desires are exactly the same as they were 30 years ago, we have a problem. Yeah. Told you. Don't get comfortable with your old desires. Don't keep feeding them. Starve those old desires and turn them over to Jesus and say, Lord, I want new desires. Give me a heart for the things of God. Give me a desire for your word. Give me a desire for worship. Give me a desire for holiness. This is an important part of true holiness. We talk a lot about our words and our actions, and I'm gonna say that in a minute, and that's important. But we skip this step. We skip this step. We're not talking enough about our desires. True holiness 
is about holy desires and confessing unholy ones and saying, God, give me your desires. I want to love the things you love and I wanna hate the things you hate. I wanna have desires that reflect your desires, God. Give me those desires. Third, we wanna be holy in our thoughts. I'm gonna go quick here because this is not new information. The Bible says take every thought captive in obedience to Christ. We have to pursue holiness in our thoughts. Our desires and our thoughts, you put desires and thoughts together and that is ultimately what produces unholy words and actions. So we gotta attack unholiness at the desire and thought level. Capture old thoughts, establish new thoughts. Number four is our words. Um, all I'll say here is the Bible says so much about our words. So much about our words. Ephesians 4.29 says, only that which comes out of your mouth should be those things that build others up and not tears them down. Proverbs has so many proverbs up against gossip, slander, lying, falsehood, hateful speech. The proverbs just one after another coming after us because our words are unholy. Holiness extends to our words. We too often excuse sinful words as slip-ups. No big deal. They are a big deal. Most of the counseling that you guys are in right now is because of something somebody said to you. Yes. Words are a big deal. Oh, I just, I didn't mean to hit send on that email. Yes, you did. You wrote that email. Come on, church. You wrote it. You meant those words. We need to get holy in our words. Number five, holy in our actions, what we do with the members of our body, all of our conduct. We are to be holy in all of our conduct. Don't separate what you do with your body from your soul. It's all connected. This is what I mean when I say we have to think holistically about sanctification. All that we are, every part, our identity, our desires, our thoughts, our words, and actions, this is what it means when the scripture says, be holy in all your conduct is all of these things. Let's finish by making some commitments to each other to pursue holiness together. First, you got to determine your desired destination. You've got to make a decision of the will this morning that you want to pursue holiness as a goal. Everybody in this room, you got goals for your life. You got goals professionally, you got goals financially, you have goals relationally. Do you have a spiritual goal? Do you have a spiritual goal that includes holiness? Is that even on your radar of the thing you're running after? Not just I wanna be this leader in church or I wanna teach this Bible study or I wanna be this influencer. Do you have on that radar, one of my goals is I wanna be holy. I wanna become more like Jesus. That ought to be at the top of your list. Holy as God is holy. Listen to John Owen on this. This is amazing, listen to this. He says, be killing sin all the time. Make it your priority every day. Always be doing it as long as you are alive in this world. Don't take even one day off. Always remember, be killing your sin or your sin will be killing you. That's John Owen. Make it a goal. Number two, leave your past behind. I know that one of the biggest struggles for everybody is, man, Keith, you're talking about that. But I've just messed up too much. I got too much junk in my past. I got all these things I've done. I just... This is not even possible for me. Listen, this is the beauty of the gospel. The beauty of the gospel is your past is your past. Jesus has dealt with your past. You don't have to live like you used to live because you are not who you used to be. You are not destined to do the things that were done to you. You are not destined to do the things you used to do because Jesus has saved you. This again undermines the power of the gospel. You are not who you used to be. If you are in Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit, you are set free from your past. God doesn't want you trapped in your past. Satan wants you trapped in your past. Again, I've said it before, the devil's a liar. You are not who you used to be. You are new in Christ. You're a new creation. So let's live out that new identity. Leave your past behind. Number three, find a running partner. I know you're tired of hearing me say it, but it is so important. You cannot be holy alone. You cannot be holy alone. You must develop holy friendships. 
If unholy friendships lead us away from God, holy friendships can lead us toward God. Men, can I challenge you for a minute? This is a problem for us. Okay, the ladies in the room, they do a lot better job at building, sustaining, strengthening friendships than we do as men. Men, we need godly friends. We, men, listen to me, you need godly friends. You will not become holy by yourself, you won't. You cannot become holy in isolation. This is why you gotta get into a men's group, you gotta get into a discipleship group, you've gotta get into a small group because we need each other to become holy. Fourth, fill your mind with godly content. When I was a young man, um, I felt like there were a lot of Christians who were really weirdly legalistic about a lot of stuff. Like uh, when I first became a youth pastor, my pastor was like anti all movies, like no movie. Like, oh, I came from Hollywood, that's terrible. Like you can't watch any movies. He was passionate about it. No secular music, all this stuff. And it felt like, it's like some weird rules. Like, why do we have these rules, okay? And so I think I was part of that generation 30 years ago that was like pushing that pendulum away from like these weird legalistic restrictions. Here's my concern today, is we've pushed the pendulum way the other direction. And so now I run into Christians all the time that have no boundaries on what they watch, no boundaries on what they listen to, no boundaries on what they consume. That is foolish, it's just foolish. I'm not gonna tell you what those boundaries should be. I don't wanna become the legalistic pastor who tells everybody these are the rated movies you can watch and these are the rated movies you can't watch. I don't wanna be that guy. I don't think that's the heart of grace. But I do wanna say to you, if you're pursuing holiness, there ought to be things you turn off. There ought to be things you walk out of. There ought to be things that you go, yeah, I'm not in for this. Do you hear me? So there needs to be something, there needs to be some filter in your life where you say, I'm not gonna consume this because if I'm moving toward holiness, this is moving me the wrong direction and I'm not gonna consume it. We have to fill our minds with godly content. We gotta determine what those things are. We will not watch, listen to, or read. Finally, daily dependence on God. You and I cannot become holy without God. You have to open his word every day and connect with him because what I said is true last two weeks. Only God is holy. For us to try to be holy on our own will not work. Now I know you're like me and there's a lot of days you wake up and you don't wanna be holy. Can we be honest in church this morning? There's a lot of days you wake up and you're like, I'm tired, I'm sick and tired, I'm tired of being sick and tired, I don't wanna be holy today. God, can I take today off? I'll start working on it tomorrow. We have a lot of those days. My encouragement to you, okay, is that when you feel that struggle in your heart that you're not desiring holiness, Please listen and I'm done. That lack of desire should bother you. If a lack of desire for holiness doesn't bother you, then I would say to you, you need to be born again. Are you hearing the weight of what I just said? Yes. If you don't desire holiness, I understand. You're human but it should bother you that you don't desire it. But if it doesn't bother you that you don't desire holiness, something is wrong spiritually at a heart level. And don't ignore that. Let's pray together. Holy God, you are awesome in this place. You are worthy of all of our devotion, commitment, and sacrifice. Lord, we confess to you that there are a lot of days where we don't desire holiness. And we pray that you would forgive us of that and give us a new, fresh desire to be holy. 
I pray over your people right now. I pray for a distinctive holiness. I pray, Holy Spirit, you would whisper in each person's ear the step they need to take to be more holy. I would submit to you this morning, you already know what that is. You already know. You already know. I've been preaching for 45 minutes. You've known the whole time what the Holy Spirit has been saying to you that you need to stop doing or you need to start doing to be holy. You already know. My question for you, friend, is will you surrender that to God this morning? Lord, we want to be holy like you are holy. We need your help. Holy Spirit, give us that desire. I pray City View would be a light on a hill, a beacon of distinctive lives that stand apart as holy unto you. Please, Lord, give your people courage this morning to take their next step toward holiness. In Jesus' name, amen.